Excellent. So let me just quickly introduce the panel. I think everyone knows who Howard is and, and his fantastic presentation this morning. Uh, <coughs> to Suzanne uh, Timms. Suzanne's the Manager of Policy Strategy at Dairy Australia. Uh, <coughs> Jim Whelan, who's the Research Director at the ARC Research Hub for Medicinal Agriculture at La Trobe University. And Jeannie Price, the Principal Research Scientist at Ag Victoria also based out at, at uh, La Trobe University. So I think Howard told you this morning about his journey, and I think it's fair to say that we're going to talk now about the technology. If you think of all the technologies that are out there that are going to have an impact on, on agriculture and on sustainability, we're going to talk about the technology that's going to have the biggest impact. And hopefully you'll agree with us at the end of this panel if you don't already. This, you know, these are, are amazing technologies uh, we'll talk about some of the things that are already happening, but we'll also, also talk uh, about the future. Um, and then we'll have an opportunity for you to ask questions as well. So the first thing, I'll just ask the people who you haven't met to, uh, to say a few words about them and make an opening, some opening comments, and then we'll, we'll move into uh, more detail. So Susanna, do you want to start us off? Thanks, Paul. I'm representing dairy farmers here today, so if you like, the, uh, the customers of the new technologies that are coming down the R&D pipeline. And uh, I'll, I'll hopefully explain how some of these new technologies uh, can provide solutions to the very real challenges that dairy farmers face in producing milk. Um, I think it's important to give a brief overview of the dairy industry so that we can discuss the role of scientific innovation within it. So dairy is one of Australia's cornerstone agricultural industries. The value of farm gate production ranks third behind beef and wheat uh, at around $4.3 billion. 42,000 people are employed in the dairy industry, uh, on dairy farms and in dairy processing. And so the sector is a huge contributor to Australia's rural uh, communities and rural economies. Most milk is produced in the southern states, but all states have dairy industries that provide fresh drinking milk to towns and cities, and milk and custard and yoghurt and cheese are produced in all Australian states. But of course, as Dr Shapiro said this morning, the speed of change is faster than our response, and the industry faces significant challenges. Some of you might have seen widely reported in the media um, of very recent times, farm gate milk price, and climate variability are hugely uh, challenging and of course have been over the course of the past 20 years. Making a profit has become more difficult and dairy farmers are facing very high costs. The cost of production is uh, not keeping pace with, uh, sorry, is higher than productivity gains. Costs such as water, feed, labour and energy are making it uh, very difficult for dairy farmers. And this is reflected in recent surveys we've done around dairy farmer sentiment. Only 34% of Australia's dairy farmers feel positive about their industry. Only 43% expect to make an operating profit this year. And 64% are very concerned about the cost of feed and its availability. Production is down 6% in the last 12 months and we expect another drop of 3 to 5% in the next 12 months. This is explained by those high input costs and the reduced size of the national herd. And this is where innovation comes in. These are the sorts of questions farmers are asking scientists. How can we make more for less? How, for example, can we make scarcer water go further? How can we improve the performance of our pastures and crops that make up the milking cow's diet? How can we use these new technologies to resist disease, improve cow welfare, and how can we improve cow nutrition to lead to more milk and less methane gas? Gene technology we consider to be one tantalising tool in the toolbox uh, because there is a growing global demand for dairy and we know that dairy is a powerhouse package of nutrition. Thank you. Jim? Thanks, Bob. Uh, I'm Jim Whelan. I suppose I was just thinking about this there. I, I was lucky enough to start university when my electrobiology started. And I think as scientists, for the first 20 years, we all thought it was a very academic discipline. But then with the sequencing of the genomes, 
we really got the glimpse that we can actually move outside models and we can actually, and then in the last 10 years, we can actually work on real problems. And I think that's the exciting thing about these new technologies, that we can actually go directly to crops, because I'm a plant biologist, or even things that aren't in crops, and we can speed up the whole domestication process. It's really exciting that if you look at some of the examples like, you know, cutting uh, farming in Australia, it's like they've had a reduction of 90% in pesticides with the introduction of some of these new technologies. That's not just good for the farmer, the environment has benefited greatly. You look at the environment up there, all the beneficial insects have flourished in that environment and other things like that. And we have a chance to do that over and over and over again. We've got a chance to bring all these new crops into the food chain and to really get that diversity that people are looking for. So while I would say that we mightn't have a second green revolution, I really think optimistically, we actually have the tools to solve the problems. We now just need to be let do it and move forward. Thanks so much. Jeannie? Uh, so my name is Jenny Price. Um, it's really great to see so many young people actually in the audience. Um, just a little bit about my, um, I suppose my, my life story is that um, I grew up on a farm in the UK, dairy farm, and I became really passionate about dairy cattle breeding when I was about 11, and that was because my parents gave me a show calf, and I quickly realised that to breed the next generation of show calves, I needed to pick the very best bulls to make to my cows, and I was reasonably successful at it, I guess. Um, that inspired me to study genetics at university, so I went to University of Edinburgh, and I'm trained as a quantitative geneticist. Now, what that means is that most of the traits that I'm interested in, that I work with, are, um, are controlled by very many genes. So examples of that for humans are things like stature, but in dairy cattle might be milk yield, fertility, health traits... Um, even um, environmental sustainability traits like methane emissions, they're controlled by, by very many genes. So the work that I do is really to develop breeding values to um, help us to improve those traits, particularly in dairy cattle breeding. Thank you very much. So that's our panel. So I think we, we can cover both animals and plants and, and quite a few industries. So let's just talk now about some of the things that have already happened you know, with the technologies. Um, and, and Howard, do you want to just set it, start us off with, with one or two examples of your favourite examples of the use of these technologies? Well, I, I think papaya is a great one. Uh, there's a virus that was impacting the entire production of the state of Hawaii, which is the largest producer for the United States of papayas. And a, a wonderful story about a sole individual plant breeder worked kind of anonymously from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Ag Research Service, and he came up with a genetically engineered papaya. And as you can imagine, this was at the height of the anti-GMO uh, activity, and a number of individuals thought it was a terrible thing that he had done this. The entire island was going to be wiped out. I mean, there would be no more papaya growing. It's very tricky. Viruses are really tough. They're tough in human beings. They're tougher in plants. They can't, take, can't change their environment or go to the doctor and be treated. Uh, so he developed this incredibly, incredibly wonderful new variety. And finally, he was allowed to put it into the land and then to replicate it. It's grown everywhere in Hawaii now. The... the Angst is over. Americans eat this papaya year-round. No one complains. No one's gotten sick. There's no danger. As uh, Jim was saying about the cotton here in Australia, the benefits have been enormous. Uh, there's one other wonderful example that hasn't quite reached the place of the papaya, and that's golden rice. And golden rice is a vitamin A rice. And you saw from my slides earlier what night blindness looks like if you don't have the right uh, vitamin A in your diet. And even though it's a complicated story, uh, the Africans were essentially locked out of the market because of potential boycott by the European Union and the UK uh, about other products that they would be selling. So it hasn't really reached the impact that it could have, but it's now starting to eke in because the need to solve the problems with night blindness 
is, is critical. And, and, and I mentioned the word virus. If you would have told me five years ago that the African uh, swine flu would reach China, I would have said, no, not a chance. Look how far it is. How's it going to get there? Well, it, it's wiped out a third of the, of the animals, the pork in uh, China. China is the largest producer and the largest importer. It's crashed economies of production. And these new technologies that I alluded to earlier today, whether it's zinc fingers or talons or CRISPR uh, at the 12A, not the 9 level, or something uh, different that we don't know yet, these are all tangible things that we can use today to gene edit that we should be using 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, most of the resistance is ignorance. And uh, I, I just I can't imagine we wouldn't do it. And th the final point I'll make is, uh, do we have any diabetics in the audience? Really healthy group. Anybody take <laughs> heart medicine? Okay, you Australians are so healthy. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to ask this question in America, a quarter or a fifth of the audience would raise their hands like this, say, I, I, I take insulin every day. Do you know insulin's genetically engineered? The medicine that keeps me alive since I was about 42 is all GMO medicine. And it would be disingenuous for me to complain about that in one field and not, but in fact, I want to encourage you to understand the benefits have been proven and one trillion meals have been eaten with genetically engineered food without any negative response as of this date. Thanks very much, Howard. Jim, you uh, got a couple of examples you'd like to share with us. Well, one, one would be to go back to the cotton industry. And the reason for that is not for the, just for the production of cotton. Like, I mean, apart from in Australia, in the US, like, cotton is not a, it's a big crop, but it's not a major crop. But it was accounting up to 70 to 80 percent of the pesticide use. Now, we had a very good uh, example of a, a very a young innovator in one of the last sessions, like, you know, the problem with bee pollination. Well, then we don't have to use those poisonous pesticides that are killing the bees, destroying the whole pollination system and the food production if we just allow transgenic cotton to be grown. And we're all wearing it, and I think pretty comfortable. I don't see anyone scratching themselves or growing an extra arm or anything like that. So it's really not that bad. And the other thing I would say is that, I did try to do a bit of preparation for this talk today, so I was looking up some examples that the new gene editing technology. So a group of scientists went out and took a complete wild relative of tomato, and by trait stacking with, with uh, gene editing, very fast, they were able to be increase the size of the fruit. The amount of carotenoids and other health compounds are much higher than the tomatoes we, that we've bred for hundreds of years. And it has got, it's disease resistant to all the common diseases because we haven't bred those things out of it. So first of all, it solves some of this problem with that 30-year gap that you need for going through a breeding cycle. But it also actually again, allows us to go back and get that diversity. And I think it's a very important thing. One of the colleagues did bring up in that that we have, if we use conventional technologies now, we have one more breeding cycle to feed the world. That's it, we have to make the decision now. And that's a very big kind of step to make. So I think we actually have to go to these other technologies or else we would be very selfish people. Thanks very much. So before I ask Jeannie to talk to us about uh, an example, and particularly as we move away from just gene editing and GMO, um, I'll divulge, you know, probably my age too, because I was in CSIRO when I, you know, I was working on animal health and it was all vaccines and diagnostics. And my colleagues were saying, well, we, we're going to genetic select for resistance to these diseases. And it was like, bullshit. You know, like, you guys are joking. So I'm really pleased I got that one wrong. Um, so I'll ask Jeannie to talk about that area. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about more of the quantitative approach, I guess, to breeding and use dairy cattle as an example because that's obviously what I'm comfortable with. So um, if we go back over 50 years ago, um, I suppose the first major revolution in terms of dairy cattle breeding was the introduction of artificial insemination. Now what this enabled us to do was to use the very best genetics, the very best bull genetics, regardless of which country that um, bull came from. So <clears throat> typically what happens when you evaluate the genetics of a bull previously was that you had to wait about five or six years 
for that bull to have about 50 to 60 daughters. And then you would be able to evaluate his genetic merit for traits like milk production, his, the fertility of his daughters, their health, and so on. Um, now, well, I suppose um, 10 years plus, we had a, another complete step change. This is the absolute revolution in terms of my lifetime with what's known as genomic selection. Now, what this has enabled us to do is to move from waiting that five or six years for these daughters to appear to actually just using the DNA directly. Now, currently in Australia, we have um, around about 60,000 females that have been genotyped that are part of our genomic reference population and around about um, 12,000 bulls that have large numbers of daughters. Now, what this enables us to do is by matching the genotypes of those individuals to the records that have been taken, so whether it's on the cow itself or the average of a lot of daughters in the case of bulls, then we can make associations between each of those genetic markers and the traits that we're interested in improving. Now, it's a really, really neat technology because it means that for these very complex traits that are controlled by very many genes, we can use 50,000 genetic markers simultaneously. Now, the big plus point is that we can do this immediately and know the genetic merit of a calf or a, um, an, a plant just at the very first moment that that um, organism is in existence. So when a baby calf is, is just born, we can tell the farmer straight away whether it's going to be very high genetic merit for many of the traits that we're really interested in. Now, the other really important thing for me as a quantitative geneticist is how we put the puzzle together. We're trying to breed for very many things simultaneously, and we want to make sure that we put the right amount of emphasis on each of the traits. So, for example, we currently put around about half of our selection emphasis on milk production traits, and the rest of it on um, traits that are associated with animal welfare and um, sustainability. Now, this is really important because if we don't get the balance right between all of the traits that we breed for, then we can end up with um, consequences that we weren't expecting. And that's one of the, the key messages, I guess, from, um, from the work that we do, is always be mindful of the direction that you're taking um, your breeding objectives into. So if you go single track for, say, a trait like milk production, that's very likely to have um, unintended consequences. We've seen it already, actually, with a deterioration in dairy cow fertility. We're putting that right, though, by making sure that we have sufficient emphasis on those health and welfare traits to make sure that we have cows that are going to be, um, I suppose, good in terms of uh, animal welfare and also their environmental impact. Thank you. So we've thrown a few te terms around. I, I think I can look down at some of the audience and you know these very well, but I think maybe for some of the younger ones, we'll just uh, have a sort of quick explanation. The, the two big ones, the GMO and gene editing. So, so how would you want to, I know you talked about this morning, do you want to just give us a quick a differential between those te technologies? Oh boy, quick. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is about a six week class at UC Davis. <laughs> um, the word modification is really a, a critical part of this discussion. And I, I, I want Jim to weigh in on this too. Um, when I think about looking at a gene and having either an eraser and a pencil or a small scissors, that's gene editing. Keep that in mind. So you, there's technology which you can actually go in and erase a piece that you think is, is a receptor or a generator of a disease or a fault, and then just take a pencil and draw it back together. Those are the metaphors. When we look at genetic engineering, it, it's, in many ways, it's a much more complicated system. GMOs were also unliked because they were owned by a few small companies. And pretty much you were in the hands of those companies. 
CRISPR and its related 9 through 12A are democratized technologies. And it makes a very big difference that we were talking earlier how many labs in Australia are already using CRISPR. Every university has probably five or ten labs that are working on it. We have 50 at UC Davis sort of more or less going on at this time. So the ability and the access and the use and the precision is, is something that's quite interesting to me. We also have the ability with using these technologies of editing to do something very different and be able to stack, as you were talking earlier, sequences. Ron Platt recently made what we call moves, 25 moves in a single gene. He said he could do a dozen more, and then in the quote I put up there, it's possible to do hundreds more. So the ability to do what Jeannie was talking about that is sometimes complicated in animals, we have the ability to know better how to do it with greater accuracy. So I'm a gene jockey at heart, and uh, I always have been. I love genetics. First time I moved pollen from one plant to another and got the progeny, and it was, it was different. A little bit apparent on this outlier, a little bit apparent on that outlier, but then you start to understand what it is to do this. These new technologies are just making a precision about that that has never been known. And Jim made a point that I should have made earlier. We don't have but a, a, a generation of plant breeding to get ready for the hell that's going to be paid when food becomes scarce. And these technologies allow that. But Jim, you want to add into yeah. this some? Um, yeah, I think for gene editing, I think what we've got to understand is that every time a cell divides in our body or a plant's body, there's a mutation. It's random, it occurs. The only thing that gene editing allows us to do is to pick the one we want. That's all it does. It's completely natural. So rather than driving down the freeway blindfolded on your way home, gene editing means you actually have a pair of glasses. That's what I would say gene editing is. Okay? So, so to me, it's a very natural thing to occur. It's a technology. And why, I mean, we can't deny, we, we are living in buildings, we have clothes, we use technology every day of our lives. Why would we throw that technology out and use all this other technology? The only thing I will add to it is, and I think people would agree, is I would not like to demonize GMOs because while they have some bad press out there and while they weren't introduced well because companies coming out and saying plants don't have DNA did not help them get accepted, GMOs, I think as you said, I didn't, ha I didn't know that figure, but a trillion meals have been eaten with not one side effect. Now, again, I love my organic lettuce, but I tell you, if you don't wash that very well, you will have a pain in your gut in the morning. So <laughs> lots, lots of people have unfortunately died from food poisoning from various things. Like, you know, I think, I, think, I think in Australia at least one person dies every day from a salmonella, from chicken. That's it. You know, but we don't ban chickens. So I think we just have to put everything relative. And I'm not saying we should bring our food there that's not safe and things like that. But we can't raise the bar so high because you can never, never, never absolutely really sort something out. And I think when scientists are asked that question, that's why they won't do it. And I think it's really not a fair comparison to make. So that would... Hmm. I just want to say one thing. I'm not, demonize, I'm not demonizing. Uh, if it sounded like it, some of the companies could be demonized, but not the, not the actual outcome. If you look at uh, BT Cotton in India, it saved the industry which was small holders almost exclusively. And many people complained that it was ownership and it's this and that. I'm telling you, you go to India now and you see a small holder who's growing BT cotton, uh, they're lifting themselves out of poverty. So it's very, very, very important when we understand this. Um, the other point that I would make, just really quickly, when I grew up, cotton was grown in Texas in the United States. Now it's grown in Kansas. When I was getting my uh, advanced degrees, maize was only grown in the corn belt of the Midwest. Now it grows in Saskatchewan. Where else are you going to grow food? I mean, you're not going to grow it on the Arctic Circle. 
So we need to be able to adapt these plants to take on climatic conditions that they've never ever been asked to take on before. Excellent. Suzanne, let's go back to uh, how industries, what industry is looking for uh, in these technologies and, and you're going to talk about what, what the dairy industry is investing in and, and what we're expecting. So at the very local level, Australia's dairy farmers are at the moment investing their levies along with the Victorian government to improve perennial ryegrass. So in Australia and New Zealand, our dairy herds live largely outdoors. It's a grazing system involving pasture species and other fodder crops and, it, and uh, some supplemented with some grain. In other places, dairy cows are housed intensively. So we can't import pasture research from elsewhere. We need to invest in that research here in Australia for our industry here. So some of the technologies that are being uh, used to improve perennial ryegrass um, are, are regulated and others are not. Uh, we're working on hybridisation, genomic selection, phenotyping, gene editing. All of these are horses in the, in the R&D stable, if you like, in this race to respond. And we're chasing yield and persistence and quality in those, in those pastures. We're using a zinc finger nuclease gene editing technique which is best conceived of molecular scissors or in a razor, as Dr Shapiro just said, cutting out or deleting four characteristics, four genes. Two relate to ryegrass allergens, uh, which cause hay fever. Those are being cut out. The other two genes control the woodiness in the plant, which makes it hard to digest. So deleting the genes that code for that lignin makes the grass more palatable more, easy, more easily digestible by the cow and massively improves its efficiency in the stomach. So the cow gets more energy from the plant. We call this high energy ryegrass because it has a higher metabolizable energy content than regular varieties. It's like giving the cow Powerade or perhaps a Mars bar. So there's no, there's no foreign DNA in this process. The gene edit technique simply cuts the strand and it repairs itself. So how could a farmer use that technology in the farming system? Well, in a number of ways, she can use it to get more for less. She might increase the production per cow from the same amount of land. She might reduce the amount of forage that she has to bring in from elsewhere. She might increase the stocking rate in a, in a, in a given pasture. She might shift the calving date and extend lactation. Or she might, in fact, produce more silage uh, to put away for the next year. There'll also be water and nutrient use efficiencies from this as well. And so you can see that this, this solution is attractive for a dairy farmer who's operating in an increasingly volatile uh, environment. We've done some independent modelling to get some understanding of what value this creates for the dairy farmer. And um, our modelling suggests that it would be, could, we could extract an extra $600 a hectare from the ryegrass, or around $30,000 a year by the time it's fully adopted across the farm. That's a fairly conservative modelling exercise. But when we actually collate all of those technologies, all those horses in the stables together in a stacked way and bring a new elite ryegrass to market, then we think that the benefits could look more around $1,000 a hectare. And so you can see in these challenging times, this is an innovation that a dairy farmer would want. Thanks very much. I had the opportunity, uh, I think last year we did, up to Hamilton and actually look at the trials. So just to give you a visual, so you're looking out on a paddock, there's 330,000 individual plants out there. there. It's a blinded trial, um, multiple repeats. It took them three months just to plant it. Um, uh, and I think that's running for a couple of years, that, that, that trial. So each day, uh, twice a day, a drone goes up and flies the whole paddock in about 12 minutes and measures the, the, the growth of those plants. And then there's various other technology to measure nutrition. So, you know, as a scientist, to, to go out and see that experiment in action was, was fantastic. If, if I perhaps could just add also that obviously this work at the moment is in just perennial ryegrass, which enjoys yeah. life in a cooler climate. And we're very much hoping that this this uh, innovation we can roll into other pasture crops and other fodder crops in the future too that are suitable to other climatic zones. And of course we're also very interested in innovations that are happening in the grains industry in feed wheat, barley and those types of things. If there was drought resistance in those crops that would make uh, feeding our animals in, uh, in a dry climatic sequence possibly more affordable. Yeah. 
So one of the things we've touched on, we touched on obviously disease resistance, but you know, uh, uh, when you look at the UN sort of uh, sustainability, a big important issue is environment. So one of the things a lot of people don't quite understand is, is how important some of these technologies are going to be in meeting our environmental goals. So Jim, do you want to start us off on this one? Uh, yeah, we, we can. I think uh, one way to put that is, well, I mean, we, obviously we live in Australia and we, we, we deal with that context on a, a local or national level, that I saw someone showed me a map of the world the other day on a talk, it was their at the conference here, and uh, when you draw a circle around China and India, and we're not in it, and Europe's not in it, and the US are not in it. So first of all, we have to understand that more people live inside that circle than live outside that circle. And uh, within that circle, there's two or three hundred million farmers, small farmers. And we have to develop technologies that can be used by them in a royalty-free way so they can feed the world because that's who's feeding a lot of the world. And I think when you think the amount of, say, I'll, I'll talk particularly about fertilizers, whether it be nitrogen, phosphate, and things like that. And I'll talk particularly about rice. Now, you think rice work like lowland rice, and that's the, the large one, grows in a submerged environment. Phosphate is water-soluble. So 90% that can be put on, which is expensive, gets washed off. Now, that causes all sorts of problems in the water system, apart from being expensive, putting the price of food up and everything like that. What these two new technologies can do is it can reduce dramatically, like by 70 and 80% the amount of that that needs to go on, and it can increase the plant's ability to use that. I think someone talked about uh, phosphate, like nutrient use efficiency. And that's what these technologies can do. We can go back and learn from wild type species, because we have them in Australia, we have them in South Africa where you have plants, that grow on soil that have got little or no phosphate. And we can figure out how they do it, and then we can change the genes with the editing technology to make sure our crop plants can do it. And that can re really reduce the environmental footprint, not only globally, but again, if you went to the Great Barrier Reef, the runoff from farming there then would be really, really reduced. So you have an environmental benefit, and you have a social benefit for farmers who actually don't have to pay for high fertilizers, and it, the business is sustainable. So I think it's really important that these new technologies are not just focused on large multinational companies making money. In fact, the other way around, you have to buy less. They're actually focused on environmental and sustainability and for the primary producers themselves who are really, you know, again in Australia, but in many parts of the world, is to maintain regional and rural communities. Yeah. Gene, do you want to comment on the livestock? Because this is something we can do in the livestock area as well. Sure. Um, it's, it's something that we've been um, working on, I suppose, to a, to a large extent over the last couple of years um, directly. But what's happened, I suppose, um, through the last 50 years just on selecting for milk yield has had an immense impact in terms of um, emissions per litre of milk. So in Australia, the average milk yield of dairy cows has doubled, actually, over the last 50 years. In the US, I think it's more than quadrupled. Um, your average dairy cow in Australia now produces about 6,500 litres of milk per year, and the world record is somewhere around 35,000 litres. So there's a long way to go. Now, average milk production internationally is around about 2,000 litres. Now, the biggest single thing that we could do to reduce the emissions per litre of um, milk is to actually double the level of milk production. That's an immensely large challenge, and it shouldn't be taken lightly. So we have actually already had an impact in certainly very developed countries with just selecting on, on traits like milk production on a per litre basis. Now, there are some other things that we can do to make some even greater progress. And at our Agriculture Victoria research facility down at Allen Bank, we've been measuring the amount of methane on a per cow, at a per, per cow level. Now, contrary to popular belief, methane comes out of a cow's mouth, so it's actually her burps that we're measuring. And we've developed this equipment that it's pretty much like it looks like a backpack. And a, and a cow has this little device that um, actually measures the amount of or proportional amount of methane that comes out through each of her burps. So we have very accurate measurements on a per cow basis of the methane that she produces over a three or four day period. 
Now, we've got around about 500 cows that we've measured individual methane on. We've matched that up to the DNA markers. So for each of those cows, we've got these 50,000 genetic markers. And we can start to work out which ones are likely to be um, more environmentally friendly in terms of having reduced amount of methane per litre of milk produced. And those are the sorts of cows that we want to breed for in the future. Because it's a double benefit, really, that you get the higher production and you also get the reduced amount of methane um, per litre of milk produced. So those are some of the things that we're developing. Now, one of the cool things for me as being an international researcher is that there are other research groups around the world who are trying to do the same thing as us. And by bringing our data together, we can achieve something much more, um, I think, with greater impact internationally than working by ourselves. Now, of course, we're still talking about um, the developed world, so North America and Europe. There's still, I think, the major challenge for the rest of the world to try and crack in this space. Thank you. Howard, do you want to join this conversation on the environment? I want to offer to help the dairy industry here. We have Please. a alfalfa that uh, produces twice the amount of protein and uses 65% less water. Uh, so uh, it's genetically engineered. In the, wor in the world of um, rice, we were able to reduce the methane from the rice paddy by 96% mm -hmm. with a protocol I'm very happy to share with you. Um, if I look at nitrogen fixation, the the language that is normally used is through nodulation on the roots. But that's old school. You can pull it atmospherically. And we proved that after, it only took 38 years to prove it, but uh, stubborn I certainly am. Uh, we published a paper last year on nitrogen fixation in maize. It was really profound. And do I believe you could do it with other cereals and grains? Yeah, absolutely. So the future for what Jim was alluding to, the benefit, the hypoxia zone or the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico is the size of the state of Connecticut. It's caused by runoff from nitrogen from the maize fields all over the Midwest. So if you were to replace 45% of that with atmospheric nitrogen that the plant actually utilizes and auto doses itself, then you would pretty much eliminate the whole hypoxia zone. You would also eliminate the pollution of household wells. This is all doable through genetic engineering. And though I'm, I have nothing to do with cows at all, except wear leather shoes, is uh, that in the near future, we'll be able to use gene editing, I believe, in the microbiota of the gut and eliminate much of the methane from the burping and also increase the digestibility of the, the material the cow is taking for nutrition. Because Ginny will probably correct me, it's not really great absorption of the nutrition in the gut. And if we could work on the microbiota to make it more functional, it's, this is not science fiction, this is where big data will really come in. And this is why I love the alpha zero paradox, to think in a way that we haven't thought before of these things uh, is at our hands. Excellent. Let's open up to the to audience now. Um, there's a lot of other topics we could deal with, but let's uh, see what people also want to ask. So there's some mics on the side, so if I could ask you to please use one of the microphones so everyone can hear. Um, any questions for our panel? Yes, do you want to just grab the mic on the side? Do you want to step? Um, hi, I'm Caitlin. I've been involved in the Teen Innovator program. Um, so obviously exporting to China has rapidly increased over the last few years with dairy products, especially with the infant formulas and stuff like that. Um, my question is, in light of dairy farmers, the majority of dairy farmers really um, worried about their future and in the dairy industry, do you think that we have a responsibility um, to invest and support local um, dairy supply or is the future really in exporting to international markets? 
Suzanne, I think that's yours. <laughs> you and I can probably both answer okay. this one. We export 30, 36% of uh, milk produced currently. So um, our export market is very important to us. But the domestic market has been growing and Australians are not walking away from dairy at all, but we are increasingly eating and drinking more and more of it. So there is, and I think that's because it's such a powerhouse nutritional package. Um, you know, the, the Australian Dietary Guidelines recommend two serves a day of dairy. We, we understand that Australians are consuming a tenth um, of what they optimally need of dairy foods for their health. So um, there is very good reason for Australians to stick with dairy and for us to find sustainable solutions to our farming problems. So I just might add, you know, in the sense of, you know, if you're a researcher, you're really in an international profession. Um, ben Hayes, who couldn't be with us today, would have talked about the work he's doing in India on helping them use the tools that Jeannie's talking about for better genetic selection. I was in India in, in March of this year on, on, with smallholder dairy farmers. You know, they're getting about two to four litres of milk from their animal. Also, we saw that it was a crossbred animal there. Just simple, using AI technology, eight to 10 litres. So, you know, it's the biggest dairy nation in the world. But, you know, we can help them. If, you know, the, and Jane talked about, you know, the, the elite animals are around the 30. So that the gap there is enormous. And we've got, you know, we're using the technology, we've got Australian scientists in there helping them to actually bridge that gap. Sorry, I think the question over here, yes. What you were just saying. It, it, you, you made a point, but it may have flown by most people. You're talking about going from two to eight or 10 liters per animal. <laughs> that means that the footprint of that production shrinks so they can grow more food. And, yep. and this becomes an answer to a really simple discussion. If we can decrease the footprint of the feed for cattle or the water use or the amount of milk that can produce from the smallest amount of animals, the mantra is we must produce more with less and then more with less again. Because we'll never ever hit our goals, but exactly what was just said, two to eight or 10 means that three thirds, or uh, excuse me, three fifths of the feed or whatever we need can be taken out of production for animals and made for human beings. First step towards a resilient agricultural system. Thank you. Question here. Um, could any of the panel tell me what consideration is given in the plant breeding technology world to the role of fungi, in particular endophytic fungi? How would you want to? Uh, sure. The answer is not enough, to be totally honest. Uh, there's been some great research on the mycorrhizal community. We don't know how yet to attract that to a plant or to a root system, but there's huge work going on on signaling. So you could create a biofilm on a root system that would signal to these arbuscular mycorrhizae to attract it to the plant, to give it health and all the benefits. It's still in the experimental stages, but I have colleagues that are working around the clock to do that because we all know the benefit we just don't know how to make the plant take advantage of that benefit as well as it should. So, Jeannie, do you want to comment on the agri-bio work? Yeah, so just, do you want to comment, Susanna? Uh, only to say that there is endophyte yeah. work going on That's in both Australia and New Zealand. Correct, yes. So this is, this is happening at um, and the Dairy Bio Project, which is the um, Agriculture Victoria Dairy Australia joint venture. So. Excellent. Um, another question here. Uh, Richard Dickman from Bayer Australia. So, um, yeah, we've had uh, some experience in um, uh, winning or not winning uh, public approval for some of these technologies in the past. And I, I, uh, how your reference to these new technologies being democratised? They are definitely much more precise. They're relatively simple technologies. However, they've only really been deregulated in the states uh, fully. I think in Australia we have minimal um, uh, deregulation. SDN one, the first and most minimal. Um, use of the technology and they've basically been stopped in, in the US. So unless we can sort of unblock this at a global level, it will still require full um, 
you know, deregulation around the world, which then puts it back in the camp of large companies like ourselves with all of the associated uh, negativity around that. So um, yeah, I just wonder if uh, anyone on the panel has some comments as to how we can really get the message across that these technologies are different and, and yeah, look, more targeted. I might come in there. So I live in, in Fitzroy, in a suburb for people aren't Melbourne based here. Uh, one of our distinctions is we have the only Greens Member of Parliament in the, in the lower house in, in Australia. So I went and spoke to Adam Brandt and had a conversation about the Greens policy because they have a statement that says, we don't support GMOs because they haven't been proven to be safe. And I said, well, Adam, why do you have a, an anti-scientific statement in your policy? You can't prove a negative. And he's the spokesman for science. He said, well, no one's ever told me that. So, you know, this is fundamentally how wrong we've got it with some of these areas. And then my other question to him was, you want to be the party of science. You like the consensus on vaccination. You like the consensus, scientific consensus, on climate change. Why do you not accept the scientific consensus on genetic engineering? You know, and my other question to him is, well, I assume, you know, I knew you had young children. I assume your, young, your children are vaccinated. Yes, and it's to Howard's point. Those vaccines are largely GMOs or, or, or the proteins that have been produced. So we have this complete block, unfortunately, not a logical one. It's, not a sci it's no longer a scientific debate. The science is in, uh, very clearly. Um, but we have this public perception issue. Um, I personally think some of the crisis, some of the issues we're talking about, the fact that how important these technologies are going to be to the environment in the future is going to have to drive change. And hopefully it's going to drive change um, in, in the policies of the Greens. Because you know, he really couldn't answer my questions. It's not a logical discussion that we're having. It's not about safety. Um, you know, for some people it's about the, the, the mean multinational and you know, you know all about that one. But you know, that's ridiculous as well. You know, so it's really hard when you talk to some of these people to get out what the nub of, of, of their problem is. But we, we do need to get the wider debate. Um, I personally hope with, with gene editing um, we can start the conversation a bit fresh. Um, we can talk about what it's delivering. You know, when, when people have gone out and done surveys and asked about new technologies, generally if you ask people, do you want something, particularly in human health, do you want a new vaccine from an area? Yes. They're less worried about how it was produced, as long as they see the benefit. And I think things like golden rice, except is one example in human health. But what these technologies, Jim just outlined, are going to do environmentally for us is one of the reasons that this debate has to, has to change. The only thing I'd add to that, which is not my area of expertise, but the examples you mentioned there, I would say are outside the circle, not inside the circle where most people live. And if you look at government funded research in China, I do not know a plant research lab in China that isn't using several editing technologies at the moment. They're out in field trials already, whether it be maize, rice, etc. The Chinese government have already banned saying food is GMO free because they realize the negative connotations of that. So I think we might need to look for our leadership on this rather than going to the old world, we might need to go to the new world. And again, if you want to take a local perspective on that, that's where our markets are. So I think sometimes we might need to really reposition where we are. And, like, and that leadership might come from places that we're not used to those leaderships coming from. So I would say that my outlook on it would be more positive than the experience we've had with GMO. And I think actually those countries who have big environmental problems will see the real value of these technologies for their large populations. Well, I was just going to make a, a comment about the, the regulation of these technologies and that in some ways the regulatory system in Australia arguably works in favour of the circumstance because once a product has been assessed as being safe for humans and the environment, it can be brought to market. And we've seen that in Australia with canola and cotton. 
And so we have a permissive regulatory system here that seeks to protect human safety and the environment whilst also providing innovations. Now, Bayer might experience that as a pretty expensive regulatory burden, but ultimately it's a permissive system that allows us access to these technologies in a special purpose regulator that's meant to be removed from the political process so that we can bring science to the community. Howard, you want to comment? How many of you eat Cavendish bananas? Maybe I'll get a bigger raise of hands this time. Every one of you. Are you aware of race four of Panama disease that has just struck Colombia? Yeah, a few of you are. Well, it's going to wipe out all bananas in South and Central America. It's going to wipe out bananas, as it already is wiping them out, in Africa. However, you could probably take the banana, which is clonally reproduced, and gene edit it, and give it resistance to Panama disease and black sugar toga. There is a food banana called matoke, which is the largest source of protein for people in East Africa, next to bambara beans. Also hit by these. I believe it's Queensland University of Technology that edited the matoke, and that's now beyond field trials. The government of Uganda is not really talking about it because they don't want to have their products banned in Europe. But it will soon be the first African country where this is taking place, where the solution to the most important protein food that grows easily for everyone to have access to will be fixed by an effort that came out of Queensland University of Technology. It should be the way we think about these things. And the Germans who love Cavendish bananas and eat the largest proportion for population of anyone in the world will do anything to get those bananas. And I assure you they will accept gene-edited bananas in 36 months. The other thing, just comment, is, is we, I know we largely talk about plants because that's where the technology, but... The gene editing has really allowed uh, animals to catch up and uh, you know, if people have been following what's happened in China with African swine fever, 50% of the world's pigs are in China and the estimates are up to about 30% of those have died through African, or will die through African swine fever. This is a massive issue. I'll guarantee you that they're editing, gene editing pigs now. We already have gene edited pigs for PERS disease, another important one. I'll guarantee they're doing it for African swine fever because we don't have a vaccine. There's a lot of work on vaccines, but we do not have a vaccine at this stage. So that will probably be uh, a, uh, you know, a future gene-edited uh, animal of the future. So that's allowed the, the animal group to catch up a lot. Um, I think we're largely out of time. Um, you know, what we really want to do is, is talk about what obviously we are passionate about. I, I, you know, I hold to my claim that this is a technology, of all the technologies that are out there, that's going to have the greatest impact. Um, you've heard of the examples. Um, you know, I'm hoping some of the debate, some of the, the negativity uh, can be dealt with, but I think the urgency uh, of the crisis we're facing is hopefully going to change, change that. So please join me in, in thanking our panel.